Hello everyone and welcome to Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about 10 motorcycles you can buy brand new for under $8,000 that weigh under 400 pounds that are road legal that are best for learning to ride off-road. Now, whether you're just new to riding off-road or maybe you're new to motorcycles altogether, off-road motorcycle riding has a pretty steep learning curve, and this is made much more problematic by riders who try to learn off-road riding on big, heavy adventure bikes. If your end goal, if your long-term goal is to be able to ride a adventure-style, travel-ready motorcycle in all sorts of off-road terrain, that's a great goal to have, but here's my recipe or steps that I think are good to achieve that. Number one, start on a small, lightweight motorcycle. Second, get off-road training. And third, only progress to larger, heavier motorcycles once your skills are in place. There are four main characteristics that I think you should look for if you're looking for a motorcycle to learn off-road riding. One is it needs to be lightweight. Two is that it needs to be low enough to the ground that you can firmly get both your feet on the ground. Three, the motorcycle should not have too much power. And four, it should not cost too much money. Now, the single biggest mistake that I see new off-road riders uh, making is trying to learn off-road on simply too big and too heavy of a motorcycle. I know there's a lot of marketing uh, towards adventure motorcycles, and I'm certainly guilty of that here on this channel as well. But I always emphasize for newer off-road riders, you need to learn on a dual sport motorcycle if you're eventually going to progress to riding the larger adventure bikes off-road. So while there are some specific skills to riding the large heavy adventure bikes off-road, in reality, all of the skills you learn from riding a dirt bike or a smaller dual sport in off-road conditions, learning to handle that smaller bike, are basically going to translate into riding the larger, heavier bikes later on. I can't emphasize enough the importance in being able to get both your feet on the ground. Now I know more experienced riders are going to scoff at this, and riders like myself who have a lot of experience, I don't often put both feet on the ground. I'm fine with just putting one foot down on tiptoes. But that's not the same as a new rider who's trying to build their confidence off-road. And if you're constantly tipping over and dropping the bike and having to pick it up, that's a huge energy, uh, you know, it sucks all your energy, and it's a huge uh, decrease in your confidence. So I don't recommend having a bike that's too tall for you. There's all sorts of uh, bikes out nowadays that have low seats, low suspensions, low setups. Um, so finding something that is not too far from the ground uh, when you're newer, and later you can get taller bikes if you want, but when you're new, I think this is so important. Now, I really prefer bikes uh, generally under 400 cc uh, for learning to ride off-road. You want something that doesn't have too much power. You want a gentle, smooth, linear power delivery. You don't want something that's giving you whiskey throttle or wheelies or things like that. You can get those more advanced techniques later on in your riding career. Um, this really is not a kind of motorcycle. So this is gonna be a smaller dual sport motorcycle. This is not the kind of bike that you are gonna cruise on US freeways at 90 miles an hour or 130 kilometers an hour or whatever, 150 uh, kilometers an hour. You're not gonna do that with the kind of bikes I'm talking about in this guide. Um, you can either have a separate bike for that or later on, once you get your off-road confidence up, you can buy a larger, heavier adventure bike if you want one bike that can go off-road and travel at high speeds on the highway. But all the bikes on this list should be able to maintain around 60 miles an hour or about 100 kilometers an hour. And of course, we should talk about price because the thing is, you are supposed to drop and crash and scratch and get dirty and get muddy and damage. All these things are supposed to happen and are going to happen when you're learning to ride uh, off-road bikes. You should expect that. And so the question is, how much money are you willing to throw into a mud bog, throw into a sand pit, throw into a ditch, scratch, drop, whatever, how much money you're willing to spend on something that where that's going to be happening. So that's only a question that you can answer, but I would encourage you to one, you know, look at affordable motorcycles if you're buying new and the ones on this list are pretty good, but also look at used motorcycles as well. I have only chosen dual sport motorcycles for this list. The reason for this is, well, number one, all the bikes on this list are available as of 2024 here in the USA. I can't speak to other countries. They're all street legal in 50 states, meaning that you can ride them on the highway. They're legal for public roads. The reason that I recommend this, uh, you're gonna get so much more versatility out of this motorcycle. If you just buy a dirt bike, which you might call green sticker or red sticker, these are bikes that don't have turn signals, license plate, horns, lighting equipment, stuff that make them road legal. Um, the reason I don't recommend that uh, 
it, it can be fine if you just say, you know what, you know, I don't need to ride it on the road or public road or dirt roads or forest trails or any of that where a license plate is needed. If you only want to do close course, then sure, you don't need this. But the advantage of having the dual sport is you can buzz, you know, commute to work, you can buzz around town, you get so much more use out of it, so much value for your money than you would a closed course only bike. Now the bikes on this list, I'm gonna list them in order of uh, engine displacement. Uh, and you know, keep in mind, like I've said, larger bikes are gonna be better for highway travel, they're better for bigger, heavier riders, uh, but don't let engine size fool you into thinking that's a small motorcycle. This is the common misconception that's completely false. Engine size does not mean the motorcycle is physically smaller. You can have a 250cc engine, uh, that motorcycle could be the same size as a motorcycle with a 650cc engine. Uh, you know, this is such a horrible misconception out there. Don't, don't relate engine size to the size of the motorcycle chassis frame and suspension and riding position and comfort and all that. Forget that. Engine size is something different. And don't let your friends, you know, say, oh, small bike, or a girl's bike, or whatever. That's nonsense. Don't buy into that and don't listen to that kind of advice. So uh, smaller motorcycles are the way to go when you're trying to learn off-road riding. All right, first on the list is Honda's XR150L, MSRP $3,099. I think it used to be just under, I think it used to be $29.99. Maybe it went up $100. I've done a full review on this bike. You can check that out. It's 282 pounds. Uh, seat height is 32.8 inches. Uh, this is one of the smallest and lightest motorcycles that I've ever tested here on the channel. And I had a ton of fun riding it. Um, it's a lot more capable than the little motor would suggest. Now about $3,100, this is less than the price of most new uh, premium level full suspension mountain bikes. That's a mountain bike, has no motor, and they often cost more than this motorcycle does. So what I'm saying is I think this bike is a really good value. Now this bike is not gonna go much over about 55 miles an hour or about just maybe 90 to 100 kilometers an hour, but I think that's okay if your primary intent is to ride locally or just use for the trails. It does have a little bit smaller wheels and tires and it's not gonna have premium components in any way and it does use a carburetor, but I highly recommend you check out Honda's XR150. So the pros and cons to the XR150, the pros, affordable, easy, and fun. The downsides, it's lacking power for highway riding. Next up on the list is Yamaha's TW200. This bike has so many, such a loyal fan base all around the world. Uh, some people call it a farm bike, it's got the fat tires. Uh, this is $4,999, but keep in mind there's plenty of good used examples out there. 278 pounds, 31.1 inch seat height. Um, so this bike is a favorite for people who have to tackle slippery low traction environments, mud, snow, sand, deep gravel, things that you know cause other motorcycles to dig in or lose traction or tip over and crash. The TW can go through that stuff because it's got these big balloon tires and it's one of the only bikes for sale today that has that. This bike also has a very low seat height, so it's good for shorter riders and for newer riders. And because this bike has been out forever, there's so much aftermarket, so many parts, there's so much support and owner communities, you just can't, really can't go wrong with this thing. And personally, I'm really one, of, I'd love to have one of these in the garage just to play around with. So the pros to the T-Dub, uh, big traction, low seat, and I just think it's super cool. Uh, the downsides, it's slow, not very powerful, and it has pretty limited suspension travel, so, Despite the kind of cushy tires, you're not gonna get the best ride out of the suspension if you try to ride faster. Okay, next up on the list is Kawasaki's KLX 230S. Now, I've done a full review uh, video on this bike and you should go check that out and I'll try to link that somewhere here in the card. $4,999, which is a great deal, brand new. 290 pounds, 33.2 inch seat height. Now, the S version is the lower seat height version. They, uh, they used to, I think they still make a standard KLX 230, uh, but for the purposes of this list, for new beginner riders, for off-road, I really like that S model. This bike is simple, it uses an air-cooled engine, it has a pretty gentle seat height, it has pretty good suspension and performance for the price point, and it doesn't cost too much, and of course it comes in the cool Kawasaki green, which I think is really, really awesome. I had a great time testing this bike. Uh, so the pros are available ABS, you can get the ABS model if you want, which I do recommend, and it, it does have switchable ABS. Uh, the performance is really, really good also. Uh, the downsides to the KLX 230S, uh, the seat is still fairly tall, you know, it's not the shortest bike, and it doesn't have a ton of power for highway riding above about 60 miles an hour. 
Next up, a bike that's also been around since uh, probably before I was born in some version or another is the Yamaha XT250. So $5,399, 291 pounds, seat height of 32.7 inches. Uh, like I said, this bike has been around a long time, meaning that it is time tested and time proven. You don't have to worry about it. I have ridden the Yamaha. I haven't done a review video on it, although I'm trying to do one this year. Um, it does seem like the bike has been a bit outpaced by some of the newer, more innovative competitors out there, but the Yamaha is still a solid, solid choice. Uh, what are the pros? Simple, it's easy to use, it's reliable. What are some of the downsides? Well, it only uses a five-speed transmission instead of a more modern six-speed setup, although I don't find that to be a huge problem in reality, and the power is pretty limited. All right, next up is Honda's CRF 300 LS. The important distinction being the LS, which is the low seat model. $5,749, 311 pounds, 32.7 inch seat height. So this is the lower seat version of the CRF 300 L, which I've tested and given a very thorough review here on the channel. This is the motorcycle on this list that if I were forced to buy any of these on this list of these 10, this is the one I would buy. Uh, Pretty long travel suspension still, even though despite travel being taken out of it to get the seat height lower. It has good road performance, good off-road performance, um, great aftermarket support, great reliability, great dependability, great resale value. You can't go wrong with this. You know, if you feel like you're outgrowing it, add some cool aftermarket parts, upgrade the suspension, put on a bigger fuel tank, upgrade the seat, do whatever you want to do. There's all sorts of stuff you can get for it. Um, you can even get big bore kits and get more power out of it. So. This is the bike I would buy on this list if it was for myself. Really, really, really nice. Next up is a bike that I just recently concluded a long-term video series with, which is the Kawasaki KLX 300. This is arguably, I think, the most off-road capable uh, motorcycle on this entire list. And the reason for that is to do with the high quality, fully adjustable front and rear suspension. So this bike is 6,199 bucks, 302 pounds, Seat height is up there though, 35.2 inches. Now, versus the Honda 300, the Kawasaki is pricier, but you get better suspension out of the box. So if you're somebody who doesn't wanna tinker with the suspension and upgrade it and do that, you might wanna get the Kawasaki. I also think the Kawasaki is maybe a little bit better looking. Uh, it does have a pretty high seat and it does cost a little more money, so we've talked about that. Um, if you are a little bit taller and you can handle the higher seat and you want that higher level suspension quality, then the KLX should be number one on your list. Um, you're probably not gonna outgrow it as soon as you would some of the other bikes on this list. So the pros, great suspension, very capable, very good power. The cons, tall seat height, and it's kind of expensive. Okay, next up on the list is really more of an adventure bike. So branching out a little bit from the dual sport bikes, but still keeping it to below 400 pounds. Uh, Kawasaki's Versus X300, 6,199 bucks, 386 pounds, really reasonable 32.1 inch seat height. So this is, uh, I think, maybe the only bike on this list that actually uses a twin cylinder motor. So it's a little parallel twin motor. What that means for you is less vibration, uh, good you know, horsepower, more power for riding down the highway. A bike like this is a lot heavier than a dual sport bike. This is about 85 pounds heavier than a 300 dual sport option would be. Uh, that's good on the highway, you don't get blown around as much by traffic, but it's a negative off-road. So if your focus is really to learn trail riding, then I'd probably stick to one of the dual sports. But this is a good small adventure bike and one of the only adventure bikes under 400 pounds. Uh, these have been ridden around the world successfully by a number of people. So the Pro, smooth twin cylinder motor, very highway capable. The downsides, it's heavy, and it, the engine doesn't have a lot of torque or the greatest power delivery for off-road riding. Okay, next up is another adventure motorcycle, a little bit heavier than a dual sport, just like we talked about with the Versus. This is BMW's G310GS. Now, I've done a full video on this bike, and I'll try to link it here in the card. MSRP, $5,695, which I think is quite a bargain for a brand new BMW motorcycle with a three-year warranty. Um, 386 pounds, so it is, you know, it's an adventure bike, so it's heavier. 32.8 inch seat height, I think that's pretty competitive. Now this uses a single cylinder motor compared to the Kawasaki we just talked about, so it's not quite as smooth of a motor as that Kawasaki. Um, you sacrifice some off-road 
ability and a lighter weight to get more versatility, more on-road, more highway performance. You can still hit upwards of about 85 miles an hour. So this is a bike for riders who want a little bit more on the highway than some of those dual sport bikes. The pros, highway ability, uh, and great financing options through BMW. You can, they have a, a program, which is a balloon financing program. Uh, they call it the Easy Ride here in the US. I think you can get one of these for like, I don't know, between 50 to $100 a month, which is less than a tank of gas and a truck, right? Uh, so anyway, what are the downsides? Well, it's heavier than a dual sport bike. Okay, next up on the list, one of the most expensive, I think the most expensive bike on the list and probably the, uh, in my opinion, the sportiest, most fun, most uh, road capable bike, uh, KTM's 390 Adventure. This thing is an absolute riot to ride both on and off road, but it really excels on the road. 7,599 bucks, 379 pounds, and these are all wet weights, by the way, fully fueled up. Seat height, 33.6 inches. Now, the 390 can give some larger motorcycles a run for the money on the road. Get this thing on a twisty paved back road if that's your thing. Man, this thing is killer. It also has a surprisingly, an exceptionally good ability to cruise down the highway 80 miles an hour without too much vibration. Really good power from this very punchy single cylinder motor. Um, really sporty chassis design. Uh, it has a ton of features, it's travel ready, it's really like a, just a smaller adventure bike. Now, is it as good off-road as a dual sport? No, of course not, because it doesn't have the ground clearance, it doesn't have the suspension travel that the dual sport bikes will, but you're trading off for that highway performance. And being under that 400 pound mark, I would still give it the green light for beginner riders trying to learn off-road riding. <laughs> so the pros, it's quick, it's uh, extremely fun and has really good features for the price. The cons, the ground clearance and suspension is kind of limited. Okay, next up is Suzuki's DR650 SE, the venerable DR, and uh, there'd be thousands of angry people if I didn't put this on the list, so here it is. Uh, MSRP, $7,099, 366 pounds, and a 34.8 inch seat height. So the DR650 is going to be good for somebody who wants a really solid, all around, dependable motorcycle, but with a taller seat height than some of a lot of the other bikes on the list, you're gonna to have to be maybe a little bit taller, a little bit stronger uh, to handle this comfortably. This is one of those bikes where if you put on a larger fuel tank, a more comfortable seat, maybe a small windshield and a few other little modifications, you have yourself a lightweight, uh, round the world ready adventure travel bike. Uh, but it has really good suspension travel and decent enough suspension performance, especially for newer riders. <clears throat> very tough, very capable, never breaks down, tons of aftermarket support. Really, you can't go wrong with a DR. It's an old school design, so you do get the carburation, which means high altitudes or really cold weather, you could struggle a little bit with the starting sometimes on a cold morning, and I tend to prefer fuel injection, but there's so many pros to the DR that kind of outweigh that. Um, so this is for, again, that larger or heavier rider or somebody who wants a good blend of highway, highway ability, good off-road ability, and amazing aftermarket potential. Um, so the pros, very torquey single cylinder motor, great off-road ability, amazing aftermarket, plus they offer a factory lowering kit, which you can lower the bike down substantially in a factory approved way, and they can do that at the dealer for you. That's really, really nice. Uh, the downside is old fashioned and it's a little bit heavy uh, and the seat height is still pretty tall. All right, now should you buy a new or a used motorcycle? Well, this is really a personal decision and also dictated by finances. Generally, it is financially better and a better deal, better value to buy used because someone else has paid the depreciation and you can benefit from that. Plus, it might, or, might already come pre-scratched, which is good, kind of gets that out of the way. Save thousands of bucks on dealer fees and other things that dealers charge. Get a used bike, anyone on this list. Uh, things to look for, proper maintenance, service records, um, a trustworthy owner that doesn't seem like a, somebody who's lying, you know, size them up. Uh, Ask for service records. Make sure that the title is clear, not branded, not salvage title or anything like that. Check for signs of accidents like twisted frame or bent forks or things damaged that you can't easily explain. Also, I don't like bikes that have too many modifications because uh, we're all guilty of this as riders. We customize our bikes, but a lot of times those customizations actually make the bike worse, contrary to popular opinion. It might actually be hurting the performance of the bike. Um, in some way or making it not run as well or not be as reliable potentially. So I would steer you, especially as a more beginner rider, to look for a used bike that isn't closer to stock form, not too many weird modifications. 
All right, well, just remember that if you buy one of these bikes and you ride it for a couple years and then you don't need it anymore, you can resell it for hopefully a good amount of money and upgrade to whatever your next bike is. But also keep in mind that if you do, if your goal is to get into the bigger adventure bikes, um, don't discount the idea that you should probably keep a dual sport bike in the garage because you're not gonna wanna take a BMW GS or a Triumph Tiger or a big, pretty expensive bike down difficult, you know, rutted out trails or single track or enduro rides. You're gonna want a dual sport for that still. So so a lot of these bikes, especially with a few upgrades, would make good long-term keepers, even if you end up getting a bigger adventure bike later on. So keep that in mind. They're not just for beginners. Um, but I hope this guide has been useful. I hope this gives you some good information. I know that these are not all the bikes available, of course, but I'm sticking to mainstream brands. I'm sticking to stuff that's available in the USA from uh, mainstream brands that where there's dealerships everywhere, just to keep things simple, which I think is good uh, for more beginner riders. If I miss something, if you have questions, concerns, please put that down below. I always welcome your feedback and the community discussion below is always very, very useful. Please consider supporting Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description and the pinned comment below. Continue this independent motorcycle testing and journalism. And I really appreciate that. Other than that, please ride safe and I'll see you out there.